Welcome to the Bodhanath Stupa, one of Buddhism's holiest sites located in Hindu Nepal. This place is home away from home for tens of thousands of Tibetan Buddhists who've chosen to flee the situation at home. But increasingly, even this safe haven is being denied them, sometimes with deadly consequences. I'm Taymor Nabili, and on this edition of 101 East, we ask, why is Beijing politics threatening a spiritual migration? Every year, tens of thousands of Buddhists do laps around this monastery as a symbolic cleansing of sins. And every year, some 3,000 more Buddhists attempt to join them by making a perilous journey across the Himalayas. But these days, their lives are not under threat simply from the freezing cold and the treacherous slopes. They also stand a chance of being shot by Chinese border guards. Chan Tao Cho reports. <laughs> This daily debate on Buddhist philosophy takes place in a monastery in Nepal. For many of those who made the journey from Tibet, there is no dispute on at least one issue. They have no intention of going back. One exception is this 25-year-old monk, the most recent arrival. He made it here about a year ago. He doesn't want to be identified because he plans to go home at the end of his 14-year religious education to spread the teachings of Buddha. He's thankful to be alive to tell the tale of his three-month journey from his hometown in Tibet. We paid more than 500 US dollars each for a guide to take us here from Lhasa in Tibet. There were about 40 people in our group. When we reached the highest point of the route, on the snowy mountain, there were big cracks in the ground. We were so scared of falling to our death. We didn't have enough clothes. It was freezing at night and very difficult to sleep. Barely two months before his journey, Chinese border guards fired shots at these Tibetans trekking through the Himalayan range towards Nepal. They're shooting them like dogs. Yeah. This in full view of dozens of mountaineers nearby. Tibet welfare groups say the victim gunned down was a nun. At the time, China's official news agency Xinhua said people crossing the border attacked the soldiers who were persuading them to turn back, forcing the guards to fire in self-defense. First of all, uh, there is no uh, religious freedom. Tibetans are very religious by nature. Second, education. They don't get proper education. And even in those uh, areas where there are schools, like in the big cities, uh, it's uh, through Chinese medium. Uh, they, uh, the uh, Tibetan language is neglected. The shooting happened along the Nangpala Pass, an ancient trading trail west of Mount Everest. Refugees have also been known to come via the Kodari border, a modern-day trade route. Here, Tibet is within sight beyond the valley. There are no snowy mountains, but illegal crossings can be just as treacherous. The Friendship Bridge is used mainly for ferrying goods from China into the subcontinent and for travellers who want to enter Tibet by land. But along the river that rages below, many Tibetan refugees have been known to risk their lives trying to cross the porous border. We interviewed a guide who has led Tibetan refugees this way before. For his safety, he did not want to be identified. It's dangerous in the jungle. We have to travel at night to avoid being seen. Also, those who are not familiar with the route may fall into the river. During summer, the water volume is high. There is no chance of survival. I know of several who died this way. From one side of the river, Chinese authorities monitor everything that moves. It had no qualms about dispatching plainclothes officers across the bridge into Nepal to stop us from filming. Hey, no photo. Yeah, the later. No photo. Okay. Filming the bridge. Let go. Let go. You have no right to touch my camera. It's not difficult to imagine how guards like these would treat Tibetan refugees. For those who make it across, 
the Bodenath Stupa is an important prayer stop. Today, some 20,000 registered refugees have made Nepal their home. In recent times, Kathmandu, not wanting to alienate Beijing, has moved new refugees to India. They join more than 100,000 others already there. From Dharamshala in India, Tibet's spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, heads a government in exile. He left Tibet in 1959, a decade after China's invasion began. It's hard to imagine when the Chinese government will let him return. But the young monk we spoke to definitely wants to see his nomadic farming family again. The stakes are high for the journey home, but he is willing to gamble with his life. When I think of home, I think of my family members sitting together, chatting. I miss that. When I get home, I'll join a monastery and spread the teachings I've learned here. The journey back scares me. It's very dangerous. But I'll find a way to return to Tibet. Joining me for today's conversation are Tenzing Chopel, who is a Tibetan journalist based in Kathmandu. Also, Kapil Shesto is a political science professor at the Tribhuvan University here in Nepal. Michael Dunham is a long-time Tibetan Nepal watcher and author of Buddha's Warriors. Gentlemen, thank you for being with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Tenzing, let me begin with you. With talk of shootings in the air only very recently um, and the <coughs> refugee crossings seemingly beginning to dry up now as a consequence, what, what is the mood in Tibet? How are they talking about the border situation? I think people are pretty scared about the border situation because uh, we have, have reports that uh, there are more uh, border police uh, deployed at the border, especially particularly at Nangbala Pass. Is there fear of a, a more hard-line approach by the Chinese government? Yes, in, in Tibet, like, uh, there's a lot of restriction uh, in, in the monasteries. Recently, a monastery was closed down, shut down. It's all because uh, of the celebration of the Dalai Lama Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, that's one reason. Another reason is the Olympics, coming up Olympics. Mm. Due to the Olympics, uh, they want to restrict, uh, try to restrict every uh, uneasy okay. things coming up in Tibet. Kapil, on this side of the border, is the issue as sensitive as it is on the Tibetan side? Well, you see, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the Tibet issue is getting increasingly marginalized in Nepal. Especially as a political since, talking point. Yeah, p p politically, on the, on the whole, mm. especially since 1990. However, these uh, Nepalese rulers in Kathmandu have demonstrated either their ignorance or their indifference to the issue. And so, this has made uh, Tibetan people, uh, Tibetan refugees, who are in Nepal, very nervous. Michael, the, the feeling among some is that the reason why it's getting perhaps less play is deliberately the Nepalese government is trying to uh, placate the Chinese and keep it on the back burner as a non-issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's no secret that the government of Nepal has listened to what the Chinese want to happen here. And this has been going on for a long time. When uh, King Gyanendra became the dictator in 2005, he eliminated uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's office here, as well as a yeah. welfare office here. And yeah. uh, it's been going on and on. The question is, why did Gyanendra decide that he was going to change what has been a fairly benign and accepting policy for a very long time? Yes, and as a matter of fact, you see, uh, since the assumption of the throne by King Gyanendra, and after um, he tried to do away with democratic system in Nepal and after he tried to impose mm. royal absolutism here he became very unpopular and so um, to divert the, uh, the attention towards his unpopular regime he tried to appease Chinese by bowing to their demands right. to close down Tibetan Dalai Lama Tibetan office here. Tenzing, is there a feeling in the Tibetan community both in Nepal and in Tibet that the Nepalese government is somehow selling them out. Yes, yes, definitely. People, people, all the Tibetans people are uh, very insecure about the future here in Nepal. They fear that Nepal is uh, supporting like Chinese and listening to whatever the China's 
Tennessee. Just to play the devil's advocate, I mean, every country has uh, a certain amount of immigration restrictions, and Nepal's towards Tibet has actually been fairly liberal. I think that the Tibetan issue has become even more sensitive to the Chinese. That's what we're seeing. Uh, they, they want to adhere to a one-China policy that Tibet has always been a part of China. The Olympics are coming along. The spotlight is going to be shining on Tibet from various uh, organizations. And they want to have as much control over the political subject as they possibly can. Tenzing, there's a feeling expressed here that one, King Gyanendra is, is one of the reasons behind this, and perhaps some of the domestic issues in China. Do you think that if we have uh, a republic formed in Nepal, and once the Olympics are over, maybe all this will uh, become much less stressful? No, we, we really hope, like, after the Olympic or after Nepal gets a stable government, things might improve. But the only people fear is, like, if the Maoists come to power, then uh, their policy towards Tibetans might be more, like, harsh, uh, because they've recently uh, stated that they've, they are starting an anti-Dalai Lama campaign, uh, which... So uh, they may be more friendly to China, is what you say? Yes, we, 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 we fear that. But if, if Nepal has a more stable government, uh, we think they might uh, consider like uh, relaxing policy towards Tibetan and might uh, help like uh, Tibetans to go out like for resettlement to find like alternative third country resettlement uh, which the US government has offered. Isn't it a little extreme to suggest that China's political policy towards Tibet nationally is um, necessarily the same thing as saying that China has some kind of policy against Buddhism specifically? Perhaps. I mean, uh, Buddhism is a religion that China can't control. There's an incident that happened in which there was a magnificent sculpture being built outside of Same Monastery, the first monastery built in Tibet. Uh, it was almost completed. It was 90 feet high. and. Uh, suddenly at 6 o'clock that night, the PLA came in, they locked up all the monks, they tore down the statue and took it away. And the only reason that they did that was because uh, this, this statue was generating all of this revived faith and people were coming all over to see it, and they fear that. Do you agree? Do you think that the policy here is not just to integrate Tibet fully in the economic sense, but also in a cultural sense? Yes, because Chinese policy towards Tibetan Tibetans have been arrogant, insensitive, and hegemonistic. Chinese uh, are never comfortable with uh, Tibetans' spirit of autonomy. Because even, even the, uh, see these uh, so-called Tibetan exiles and Dalai Lama, they have not, never demanded independence. See, the, 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 at most they were demanding is autonomy. The genuine autonomy. Right. Tenzing, do, do you see any hope? Definitely. You just uh, go to uh, India, South India, and see the Tibetan monastery out there. It's just uh, uh, something that Chinese could never destroy. It's, uh, it'll, it'll survive forever. I, I feel that. But inside Tibet, however much they uh, denounce the Dalai Lama, yeah, it's. Uh, I think in Tibet, like it'll, it'll um, outside the Tibet, it'll remain, and uh, people from here will take it back to Tibet. Right. Someday. We'll no. take a short break and come back in just a couple of minutes.